Grace and peace to you. Welcome to Sabbath School Study Group, where today we're looking at the second of our five-part series in the point of the immortality of the soul. We're looking and hitting end time deceptions, things that are believed that are not in the Bible. And we want to see what scripture holds for us today. So as we look at the immortality of the soul, why are we doing this? Because we have been told to beware of the great dragon who was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. And he deceives the whole world and he does it through false truths like one we're looking at today. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And Lord, we are so grateful to know that we can be aware to not be deceived, but instead to be delivered. Do this by the truth of your word. In Jesus name we pray today. Amen. So now in our deliverance. We want to understand biblically that when we die, we are indeed dead. The Bible speaks of death totally different, unfortunately, than what most people believe and what's normally taught in society. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10, the Bible says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Why? For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. The Bible explains death's destination as the grave. It does not identify heaven. It does not detail hell as the place where we go to when we die. In fact, when we die, there's no work device or more importantly, no knowledge or wisdom in the grave. The idea of conscious thought, whether that be praise to heaven or whether it be torment in hell, the Bible says that there is no wisdom nor knowledge in the grave, no activity, no work, nor device, because up in verse five, the living know that they shall die. That's us. If you're listening to this today, good news, you're living, <laughs> but the dead know not anything. There is no bandwidth, no Wi-Fi, no reception, no signal for the dead. They don't know anything. Neither have they any more a reward. For the memory of them is forgotten. So it speaks on the one hand of us as living our relationship to those who are dead, but it also speaks of the relationship of the dead to us who are living. They don't know anything. They don't know who they are. They don't know who you are. And that's very clear and reasonable when we understand where their thoughts go, where our thoughts go, should we die? See, his breath goeth forth. The breath, the pneuma, the spirit that the Lord breathed into man, it goes back to the one who gave it. That goes back to God. That breath goes back to God. And his body, the dust or the flesh, he returned to his earth. In that very day, how do we know that this, this separation takes place where the breath goes to God and the, and the body goes to the dust? In that very day, his thoughts perish. These are thoughts of, of fear. These are thoughts of joy, thoughts of happiness, thoughts of worry that all dies that very day. So we don't see some four days later. We don't see some moment of the, the spirit making transition or some period in the moment. It happens where the breath goes back to God and the body begins the decaying process. This is the reality of death biblically. The idea of immortality after or an afterlife, these ideas came from paganism, not from preaching. They came from myths and they came from the lie, even of Genesis 3, when the devil told Eve, you shall not surely die. And that is echoed through the centuries, even today, to the misconceptions that we have. And these misconceptions are so dangerous because they give away to all the other fears and deceptions that we're going to see come into play more prominently as we near the coming of Jesus Christ. So if we understand that when the dead die, they are indeed dead. It also remembers when we die, we don't remember. We rest. See, when Jesus speaks of death, he speaks of death as a sleep. In John 11, verse 11, these things said Jesus, after he had saith unto them, our friend Lazarus sleepeth. He spoke of death as a sleep. But I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Now, the only person who can bring the dead back to life is Jesus, period. He didn't say we go. He said, I go. 
And when he speaks of his death, he calls it a sleep because he knows he has the power to raise the dead. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he'll do well. Albeit, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. He speaks of it as a sleep because of his power to raise us up, but he also speaks of it as a sleep so that we can understand the nature of death. When we die, also Ecclesiastes 9 says, their love, their hatred, and their envy is now perished. It is ended. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. This one scripture frees us from zombies. This one scripture frees us from the fear of the dead coming back to, quote, haunt us. Remember who the deceiver is and remember who his agents are. The fallen angels, they operate to take on the guise of these, quote, dear departed loved ones to deceive those who don't understand this verse. Because there's no portion, there's no anything for them under the sun. They rest, they sleep just like Lazarus slept in his grave. Finally, in Psalm 115, the dead praise not the Lord. This one verse lets us know we don't have to have a complex and wonder, well, why are, are they up in heaven having such a good time while we struggle down here? They're not in heaven. If they died in Christ, we will see that they will raise in Christ, just like Lazarus did. But if they don't have Christ, and if they don't have the grace of God, then like we learned yesterday, the lake of fire is prepared for those who refuse to accept and surrender to the love of God. Neither any that go down into silence. So the dead don't praise and the dead don't fear. They simply rest. They rest and await a resurrection. Some to the resurrection of eternal life through Jesus Christ and some revelation tells us to the resurrection of damnation where they now must pay for the sins that Jesus himself wanted to pay for. We have the choice of which resurrection, but all will see and all will choose which day our victory and our ultimate resurrection is now. Our victory in Christ is a comeback and the resurrection is the ultimate comeback. See, when you understand that when we receive Jesus Christ, when we're born again, that is a spiritual resurrection. And that gives us hope so that even if someone or even if we have to go to sleep physically in Christ, where our body rests in the grave and the breath of God returns to him, we have hope to know that the one who gave us life from the beginning and the one in whom we are born again is the very one who will raise us up again because he did it twice before when we were made and when we were redeemed. First Corinthians 15, 16 says it this way. It says, for if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. Isn't it good to know that first Corinthians makes it plain? Yes, the dead will rise. And that makes sense, everybody, because if they were already awake, why would they need to rise? If they were dancing around in heaven, why would they need to rise? No, it says if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. But we know that Christ was raised. Therefore, we have hope that they in Christ, too, will be raised. In fact, Daniel 12, 2 says many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Where do they sleep? They sleep in the dust. And he says, and he speaks of the resurrections, some to everlasting life. That's the second coming of Jesus Christ. And some to shame and everlasting contempt. This is the, the, the judgment, the white throne judgment, as some call it, when finally now the wicked are raised from their graves to receive the condemnation that they refuse to accept the clearing of the grace of Christ. Daniel speaks of it. And it's even spoken of here in verse 17 of 1 Corinthians 15. If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. It speaks in, in saying, you know, trying to, to do contradiction to say, wait a minute. Wait, if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. In other words, all this stuff is a lie. This whole faith thing is, is just baloney. But no, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Meaning if you don't have hope, then those people who died in Christ, they don't have hope. But the whole point of this book, 
The whole point of this chapter is hope to say Christ is raised. Therefore, those who are falling asleep in Christ, they are not perished, but they will raise. They will rise again and they will raid the court. You know, in, in, in some areas of sport, there is this tradition of, of raiding the court. This is when uh, what appeared to be an apparent defeat in this last minute comeback where a rival beats another team or when the underdog beats the overdog, um, people will raid the court. They'll rush the court in celebration. And what I see here is kind of analogous to the fact that when we accept the victory of Christ, we overcome in Christ. The overcomers will, will raid the earth, if you will. We will raise up and we will rise in the grace of Christ. And those who are alive will see this happening. We'll see those who are asleep in Jesus literally shooting up and joining Jesus in the sky. And we will... <laughs> We will join them. We will meet them in the air. There's so much glory and adventure and excitement in the truth than the myth and in the lie and in the deception that's unfortunately understood even by most Christians today. That is why we need to lift up the truth of rest in Christ, that death is temporal. It's a comma in Christ, not a period. And in spite of the lie of the great dragon who was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. It's time for us now to cast out their lies and take hope in the truth of Jesus, in the one who is able to raise us from the grave. Because guess what? If he can raise us from the grave, he can raise us from where you are right now. If you were blessed by this video, praise Jesus and be sure to like, share and subscribe. There is much more to see and learn on our website at changeministry.org. If you feel impressed, we would really appreciate any gift that you can give towards our work. Just click the donate.